Welcome to Test 2 Plus, everybody. This week we are talking all about artificial intelligence, and today we're going to be talking about the AI that's around us all the time, every day. And we might not even know it's there. So what can AI do, and what can't it do? We have AI already around us kind of all the time, managing all sorts of different things. There are traffic control systems that manage airplanes, like auto landing control, or ATC. The auto landing control systems help tell if a plane is too low or too high and help it land. Autopilots are another example of airline AI. They can determine any number of different things all at once. There are certain airplanes that fly by wire and the plane is always in control. The pilot can give input to the autopilot, but there are manufacturers who believe that the autopilot is safer than the pilot. So if the pilot decides to turn too far, the autopilot won't let them turn more than a certain number of degrees if they are, have passengers on board. Um, there's also autonomous driving cars. They're reading the streets. They're reading the surroundings. They're reading in real time stuff that's happening around them all over the place. Driving is a very stressful situation for the human brain. We're terrible at it. But for a computer, it's bringing in all of these variables and figuring it out. And on top of that, the reason you could call it AI is because there is that variable of human pedestrians. I could jump in front of an autonomous car, and that car has to make a decision. Does it turn? Does it stop? Can it accelerate around me? How is it going to deal with this situation? If that's not thinking, I mean, yes, it's programmed thought, but it's still there. Siri is artificial intelligence, Cortana, Google. Um, those services are all a rudimentary artificial intelligence. They're listening to what you're saying, and they're attempting to determine the answer you're looking for. And they're doing it based on context clues. You can tell Siri that you have a mother whose name is this, and it will remember that and be able to respond. And if you just say, text mom, even though you identified her as mother, these services will be able to tell the difference. They understand that mom, mother, and mommy, and all of these other little language idioms are all the same entity, which it's been programmed to do, again, which is why it's a rudimentary AI. Voice recognition in general is sort of like an AI system, but we'll come back to that. There's also modern AI, which is UAVs and drones. Uh, we mentioned self-driving cars. That's kind of some of the newest AI we have around. UAVs and drones are really interesting because they're designed to be artificially intelligent in that they can monitor wind speeds, they can adjust for turbulence, they're flying at certain altitudes and in certain ways as to minimize in military capacities, minimize enemy detection. So they're either flying very high, flying around, flying very low. Things that human brains have trouble with is flying too low to the ground. You know, if things change, we might overreact and we could crash the system. The uh, artificially intelligent drone doesn't have that problem. They're programmed to do any number of things based on input. So they can look around, they can get to an area and fly in a circle. And that's all they have to do. They can get to an area and take pictures of certain predetermined areas. They can also look for specific things like faces or specific models of vehicles and then take pictures of those. Again, programmed intelligence, but definitely artificial intelligence. They are not thinking necessarily, but they are making decisions. Often they're piloted as well. The pilots usually do the more militaristic tasks like actually dropping bombs or something. We're constantly surrounded by minor artificial intelligence is really what I'm trying to get at. Uh, they call this in the artificial intelligence community, I guess, weak AI. They're narrow tasks. They're very focused. They can only do this one thing. They can only make these few decisions. Like a self-driving car cannot drive anything but a car. It can't fly a plane. Now, if it could, that'd be pretty amazing. But it just drives cars. Other examples of weak AI are things like a Roomba, which is just the cutest little robot. Those, they clean your little room for you, and they go back to the little dock. They know where their home is. They know where your furniture is. They know where the edges of what you want cleaned or what you don't. They know where they've cleaned in the past and where they should clean in the future. This is not an ad for Roomba. I'm just saying they're funny, and they're kind of smart. The GPS system is artificially intelligent in a lot of ways, or pretty much anything that uses it, because they can understand where it is and where it needs to go. Um, 
recommendation engines like Amazon and Netflix, they know your past behavior and they predict your future behavior based on a variety of algorithms that determine what someone bought when they looked at this specific thing. How many other people bought this other thing? And they can suggest that to you. But they can suggest it in different ways. Maybe you go to look at a DVD and it knows maybe you haven't bought a DVD player. So it can recommend a DVD player or a new player or that knows that you've looked at audio equipment in the past and now you're looking at a DVD player. Hey, guess what? You need this new Blu-ray because you've looked at this other Blu-ray thing before. So I'm going to recommend these Blu-rays that you should get with your new Blu-ray player. It's making decisions. That is weak AI. The thing is, though, that as cool as all that sounds, I mean, it sounds like Amazon knows what's up. But weak AI sucks, guys. It's the worst. It's really, really, really bad. Mainly because computers are dumb. They only know what we tell them. They don't create new thoughts on their own. So image processing is an excellent example. If I show a computer a picture of a sunset, it doesn't know what to do with that picture. It can analyze it for the colors and what is perceived depth and because it's been programmed to know what depth might be in that photo and what the colors might be. But it's taking the camera, the software, and then a huge amount of programmed knowledge bases. So lots of other photos that it's looked at and been told, this is the depth part. This is the pretty part of the sunset. This is what ground looks like. This is what water looks like. It, does, it uses all of these things. And then when we look at it, we see a sunset. It sees a variety of data and then doesn't know necessarily what to do with it. They don't just look for the interesting parts of the picture. They aren't looking for the sunset and they're, look, oh my gosh, there's a little person standing on the edge of this cliff in front of this sunset. That's the cool part. The fact that it's this huge vista and there's this tiny little person. It would never even know. It would look at every pixel the same. Human brains look at that image and they find the things that are interesting. The sunset, the water, the cliff, and the tiny little person. But the pixel next to that person and the person's head are the same to a computer. It doesn't know the difference. Conversational language processing is another thing that weak AI sucks at. We talked about chatbots before. The reason that chatbots have gotten so much better, the reason that Google's voice search is really good, is because back in 2007, they created something called 1-800, or maybe 1-888, Goog411. Don't dial it. It's not a thing anymore. It closed in 2010. I actually used to use this when I had a flip phone. I'm that big of a nerd. I would call Google, and, I, and it would answer, and it would give, play a little tone, and you would tell it what you wanted to search for on Google, and it would read back to you three different results. And then you could hang up, and you could answer your bar trivia. You'd be like, oh, it was my mom. And then I could get the answer. But that doesn't exist anymore. But from that, they used those voice snippets, because it's not like radio where it just disappears. They're saving all of that voice input. And they use that to create what's called a phoneme database. Phonemes are little snippets of conversation, little snippets of voice that they could use and analyze and determine what people were saying. It got really good at understanding voice inputs. That's how Google built their first voice input database. A company called Nuance Communications does that too, using Dragonspeak, which is another company uh, Nuance, I don't know if they do Dragon, I can't remember, but uh, Nuance Communications was uh, a company that powered an app called Siri, which was just an app on the App Store you could download. I had that one too. Then Apple bought the app, removed it from the App Store, and there is some debate as to whether Nuance Communications still runs it. I don't think they're really allowed to talk about it. But their phoneme database is also really, really good. So they wanted Siri to keep being powered by Nuance because it could understand what humans were saying. But not unlike image processing, it's not really understanding what you're saying. It's not listening to, you say, words. It's listening to patterns. It's listening to every little piece of information and looking for the patterns that it's been taught to look for. The reason that when you're online, you have to type in numbers and letters obscured by lines is because a computer can't tell the difference between that and any other part of that web page. As far as the computer is concerned, all those are just pixels. And those lines make it in unintelligible for a computer. But for a human, they can look at that and they can say, oh, this is a house number. It's this number. I'll type it in. Or this is the word you know, neuron covered in some weird colors. I'll just type in neuron and I'll keep moving. But a computer can't tell the difference. Computers are so dumb that what happens is they call it a leap second, where they'll add 
a second or part of a second at some point of the year. And when that happens, the computer sees it as the same second repeating. So it's, you know, 159, 59, 59. Now it's 159, 59, 59 again. And it doesn't know what to do, so the computer starts to freak out, and it's like, I already did that second, and then it overloads, and the computer crashes. This was the whole basis for Y2K. That's how stupid computers are. They can't tell the difference between one second and the next second, whereas humans may not even notice. And we haven't even gotten into the complicated things. All we've talked about is looking at pretty pictures, listening to people talk, and being able to talk back, and understanding that time is meaningless. And we haven't gotten to love or emotions. We haven't gotten to faith. Not to mention that computers don't even understand any of that. Emotions are complex interactions of a number of very discrete hormones in the human body, and it uses conscious and unconscious systems. You can't even make a self-driving car go faster than 25 miles an hour and it gets confused. So AI, is, is, it's, pretty, it's pretty bad, guys. And there you have it. Are you using AI in your everyday life? Tomorrow we're going to figure out if AI is as dangerous as some people predict. Is the human race in trouble? Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and click here to watch yesterday's episode.